And we can just give this whole retreat now over to Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we can open our minds and just have the prayer, Holy Spirit, you lead this time together. We are very open to everything that you want to share. And we pray and allow our, our minds to be open. to healing, to release of any blocks that is preventing us from experiencing the truth. So yeah, you can just feel yourself arrive here. Maybe take another deep breath. And even though maybe the situation seems new, the form seems maybe new, let's not get distracted by the form of this situation. We will come far and we can allow ourselves to start to overlook the form a bit and just be open to content, to experience. So we want this retreat to be fully and only about this experience. So we ask that the mind is really feeling very open and we all can be open to share and express what blocks the truth from being felt. And we're not here to know anything about the form. We're not really here to get comfortable and familiar the ego mind wants to get familiar and comfortable and get a handle on the form, but we're actually here to release the form and recognize the truth. So usually in the beginning of a retreat, we allow everyone to be in touch with an intention maybe prayer, prayer for healing. So you can just allow this first session to be just a way to open your heart. Find the prayer of your heart. And you can let it come to you. You don't have to figure it out. The beautiful thing about this path is we don't have to figure anything out. It's already figured out.
So it is really about trusting and surrendering. So yeah, maybe we start just by sharing a bit. I mean, most of most of you who are here already know us quite well. We have been joining for some years now. We have a special special welcome. <laughs> Everyone is warmly welcome, and you have a special welcome. Um, yeah. So for me, this journey with the course started in 2005 when I was in a retreat with a kind of shamanic woman. She was very psychic. She, she was very, very intuitive and psychic and had a powerful connection with Jesus, like a real direct connection with Jesus. And I was in her retreats, and I think I went to two retreats with her, and it was very powerful. I was blown away. Maybe it was only one, I don't even remember, but it was powerful. And it was like, you no, know, I was with her maybe twice, because the first time I, I didn't have the course, I didn't know of the course. I had just been kind of guided to her. I don't even know how. And I was in her retreat and I I felt very very encouraged, especially by her her own experiences that she shared about, her connection with Jesus. She had healed something very complicated in her body that she had for fifteen years, some stomach issue and she had an experience of Jesus just taking her swimming every night during a long period of time in a calm lake where, where it healed. It just healed more and more and more. So she shared about those, those type of experiences. And, um, and after that first retreat, I had this strong feeling like, well... She knows something. She has something that I don't know of yet. So I, I rang her up, called her, and I said, I, I need to ask you about a book. There is a book I need to read, but I don't know which book it is. And there's something you know, I said to her. And she said, First she mentioned a, a book called The Conversations with God, and I said, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not it. And then she said, well, then there is only A Course in Miracles. And when she said that, it was like lightning struck in my heart. It was like, that's it. So, so I said, thanks, and I hung up, and I ordered A Course in Miracles, and it came the next day. And I just couldn't stop reading it. At that time, I was a psychology student in the psychology program in Sweden. And I just pushed away all my psychology books. And I just realized, this is psychology. This is what I need. And it was just super, super profound. I couldn't stop reading it. Day and night, I read. <laughs> and I kept, I tried, I had... This was my first year in the psychology program, so I tried to study because I still believed I need, need an education. And I thought I needed to become a psychologist. So I tried to study. I tried and tried and tried so hard. And I remember sitting there with these psychology books, reading like the first line in the book, and I couldn't go further. It was just meaningless. <laughs> it was just so meaningless. The Course was just pulling me. The Course in Miracles just pulled me all the time, all the time. And I prayed. I was like, well, Holy Spirit, I need, 
I need to finish the exams. I need, you know, I need to be able to to finish my first year, and I did it through prayer. I remember doing a, one of those exams that I had not studied for, but I had studied the course, and <laughs> Holy Spirit told me. Uh, you need to know this thing and that thing and that thing, and then you're going to manage the test. So I went to the university, I did the test, and I succeeded. It, it worked. <laughs> and then there was summer holiday from the university, and that first summer with the course, I had had it for about six months or seven months, and then I thought, because it was so powerful, I kept feeling like very encouraged, and and my life was kind of tough. I was a single mom and spent a lot of time alone. And so the course really kind of brought in something better, I felt. And but I I was one. I was got curious. I was thinking, well, is there are there other people? in Sweden that know about this course, that know of A Course in Miracles, I thought there must be other people that are reading it, that also have those experiences. So I googled, I went on Google, and, and then a picture came up of a very bright face, and it was David Hofmeister, <laughs> and, and it said, David Hofmeister is coming to Sweden in July, this was June. And like 7th of July, he's coming to this big um, Course in Miracles conference. Um, and I thought, I thought, I just felt sucked in. I felt Spirit just told me, you, you need to be there. <laughs> and another part of me said, what a conference? I've been, I had left church and I had, I didn't really want a big group of, I didn't want a conference, I thought, but but spirit was clear, you have to go there. So I signed up. And at that time, I was a single mom. I was kind of struggling for, to, for finances. I had a, a side job. Um, I had, I was a student and I had a job. I was looking after kids. And this conference was on a weekend from Friday to Sunday and Friday it started Friday morning and I was struggling so much financially that I had to work I had kids staying with me at night until that morning so that meant I came late to this conference <laughs> and that was very I was very shy and, and, and this conference was held in a castle in, in Sweden in the out in the countryside was at least one and a half hours or two hours drive for me to get there in the morning. So I drove there, came late, everybody had already gathered. I didn't even know where. I walk into this huge castle, corridors, looking to see if I saw anybody. <laughs> saw somebody who worked there and they said, are you looking for this conference? I said, yeah, they're in this big hall. It was like a big... King Hall, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> so I walked in through this big door and come in. So the, the hall was like this. I come in at the bottom and there's this huge circle of people sitting. Everybody's sitting. David is sitting at the top with a translator. I come in and I look, is there even a, a seat for me? I just see this huge circle, 70 people. And I see a seat over on that side. So I have, with my shy persona, I have to walk through the whole circle <laughs> to this seat, which I do. <laughs> and apparently David saw me walking in and recognizing me. Like, you know, with spirit, we, we have those connections and we recognize each other. And he recognized me as, as someone he knew very well. And then I sat there and I put a little recorder out because this felt really important for me. I, I need to record him 
And it was good because I didn't understand him. I wasn't used to listening to English, maybe like you, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't used to it. So, so I thought I need to record it at least, you know, and, and I sat there, I didn't understand <laughs> what he was talking about, but I felt it. I felt it was like, it was like a big lightning in, right, right through my heart. It was just happening. So I was there for like two, three hours, and then there was a break, and I felt so lit up. I felt so clear, and I thought, I'm going to go home. I, I got what I came for. I felt so, although this was a whole weekend event, I thought, I'm going to go home now. So I told the organizers, I'm, I'm leaving. And they said, no, 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 you can't leave. This is for a weekend. That's the ego, she said. This, this older lady, she said, that's the ego. And I just stared at her. I thought, oh, is that the ego? And, and so I stayed. And I felt very uncomfortable. I stayed overnight. Stayed, I was put in a room with another, with a woman who was crying all the time. And I didn't, I didn't get it. Why was she crying all the time. I, I was meant to go home, you know, because that was my prompt. And the day after, I had a little bit of courage to... I met David in, when I was walking around there in the castle after breakfast. I saw him and I thought, I'm going to ask him if this is... If, if it was the ego that wanted to go home. <laughs> and, and I said, um, should I, um, should I stay? Should I stay here? And he said, no, should is a word you never should use. <laughs> that was his answer. He said, you need to follow your heart. You need to follow what you're feeling. So I said, okay. So I went home, but that meeting with him had felt so strong for me that I was doubting going home. <laughs> But, but I did, because I, I wanted to obey the guidance, so I went home. But I kept feeling so drawn to be there, so... But I thought there was this feeling where I can't be so back and forth, so I, I have to go home now. So I went all the way home, but I said to myself, tomorrow morning, if I still have this strong feeling, then I have to go back. So, so I kind of gave myself the promise. And yeah, very well. In the morning, it, I mean, the feeling didn't go away, so I drove all the way back again. And David greets me. They were all sitting out for breakfast in different little tables, and he just saw me, and he just came with his open arms. Oh, the prodigal daughter is back. So <laughs> he just embraced me and gave me a big kiss. And it was just, it was just super powerful. I just felt... Uh, something so deep and strong with him and so so yeah i at the end of that conference i asked him a question i, I said I, I don't know what to do i said the course is so strong for me but i mean a psychology program i don't know what to do i said i can't really study and he said well Take your time, it will come clear, he said. You will know. If you, if you still are uncertain, just trust you will know. So I went back to the university in the fall, and, and the first lecture they had there was a, a social psychology uh, professor, and he was talking about people who go a different path. They go take another path than the beaten path of the world. He, he talked about um, philosophers or men and women who have kind of found their own way and found God's way without, you know, without the general. And that was a very un, unusual lecture. And he talked about people who go in the flower beds instead of on the path. And my heart was beating, beating, beating. And I felt, he's just talking about me. He's just talking about me, the whole lecture. 
And even that was a very big group. And in the end, I just, I just stood up. I said, thank you very much for this. I feel this was all for me and I'm not coming back here. <laughs> and, and it was very scary. I drove off that campus, that university, and felt, am I an idiot? How, am I, how are you going to sustain yourself? The ego was like, you know, I was a single mom. I had learned I have to take care of myself. Nobody's taking care of me. I have to take care of myself. I had rented a house. I had a car, I had a son, you know, so, so I was, I was scared. I was like giving the foot to, to the world, to, to my future, to, to being sustained by a, jo a good job. And, but I couldn't do anything else. It was so strong, that feeling. And I went home. And the ego was so strong. The ego just said, now what? Now what? Now what? And I, I literally just sat down in meditation and with the course, with my lesson, and prayed. And I, I sat for like three months. I, I mean, I took long walks and I had my, the job with the kids. But whenever I could, I sat in meditation. I just sat and prayed and I asked, Holy Spirit, send me my people, show me my people, show me what is my path. That was like my constant prayer and the ego doubt was just there. And I didn't want to talk to people. If someone called me, I would usually not answer. If my parents said, come home for dinner, I usually said no. Um, even if somebody knocked on my door, and it was seldom because I lived out in the country, I wouldn't open unless I felt a yes. And that's how strong my prayer was, that I wanted to know what is real. I didn't want to follow anything that, that I didn't feel was real. So, so I did that for about three months, and then I received an email that was like, that felt like an answer to a prayer. It was because before this I had been a meditator, transcend, trans, transcendental meditation. So I received an email and an invita invitation to go to a TM university, a spiritual university in Fairfield, Iowa, for a year and meditate for eight hours a day. Mm. And I was like, I felt so excited. There was again this feeling in my heart that wouldn't stop. I didn't sleep for three nights. I was super excited. I felt this I must do. But then the ego said, no, you can't. Remember, you're a mother. You can't go. You, you. And I, I was thinking, how can I do this? The rule was to stay for a whole year. And I thought, I don't even know if I can get a visa, but the TM program guided me. They said, you can get a tourist visa for six months. Please do that. So I got a tourist visa. But in my mind, I thought, I can only stay for three months. Then I have to come back to my son, because this is not OK otherwise. So I had that in my mind. So I went over to the United States with some borrowed money for a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, when I was there, they were taking care of everything. They gave, because they had brought in 2,000 women and 2,000 men from different countries in the whole world to meditate in two golden domes. And people in the village volunteered to host us, to accommodate us, to give us a room and board. So it, it didn't cost me anything to be there. So I could be there and I could learn this TM City program, which is a TM City is a program where you uh, you meditate with sutras, very uh, old sutras from the Vedas that do something in you that makes you 
levitate or lift. You you actually they call it like yoga jumps. You you lift and like and and I was very drawn to that and I I thought that that was gonna enlighten me. So I started that course and something in me there was like the spirit or a higher self suddenly just knew all about these sutras and I, I sat in meditation I went so deep I had such a deep experience and when when they had taught it to me I went home to where I stayed and the woman I stayed with I meditated I used the sutras and it was it's kind of a complicated um, uh, kind of a program that you have to keep in mind when you do those sutras. It's like a cycle of seven different sutras or something. I think it was seven, and you say them in a certain way. But it was just an inner knowing of this, and it led me actually to a profound state of mind, a deep experience, so deep. I, I felt drawn to just stay in that state. I didn't want to go to the classes. <laughs> and that was not a good idea because it, it was mandatory to come to the classes if I was going to stay there for this year. Because the first three weeks was like a school, like classes to learn this technique. So I, had, I forced myself to go to the class, to the next class, and I thought, because I, I have to, because this was so deep, I thought, I need to stay here. So I went to the next class, and I shared with a teacher, I said to her, I have very deep experience. Uh, she said, oh, this is unusual, we have to check you out now. And, and they literally like graded, we had to grade our meditation and, and there were all those rules, you couldn't wear jeans, you had to wear white clothes, and there's all those rules. And she, she said, I'm going to check your meditation and she took me into a room and she said, now you meditate for five minutes and then I'm going to ask you questions and then you meditate for five more minutes and I'm going to ask you some other questions. And she felt like a little Sunday school teacher. And I thought, this is weird, you know, here I'm with this deep experience. And I said to her, I don't need this. I don't want to be checked. I don't need it. And she said, no, you have to. We have, this is from Maharishi, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He has given these rules, you have to. I said, I don't need to. And she said, then you have to go to the headmaster of the university. <laughs> I said, okay. So I went to him, to the headmaster. I came into his room and he said, oh, you hit me with your heart. <laughs> it was the first thing he said. I came into his room, you hit me with your heart. And I said, I had this profound experience and I don't think I need this school, I said. I think I need to move on because I don't need to be checked and everything. And he said, no, no. He said, this is the Vida. You need this. You need, this is an enlightenment path. If you go off on your own, that's not good. You're going to be lost. This is very, very old wisdom, he said. You need this. And I thought, I knew I had the Course in Miracles and I I thought, no, I'm going to go. And I said, that. Um, no, I'm leaving. And again, I had this terror. It's like, what am I doing? First, I leave the worldly university. Then I leave the wisdom university. You know, like <laughs> the Veda. The <laughs> yeah. So, so and, and what also happened there was very, um, they had a pandits. Pandits are like prayer, prayer men <laughs> coming from India who pray. They are, they are brought up from little to pray all their life. They have super strict rules. They are not allowed to see women, for example. For, that's one of the rules. And, 
At this time, when I was there in, in Iowa, they had 100 pandits visiting from India. And it was super cold winter, 40, 40 minus degrees <laughs> Celsius. Super cold. And I took a walk, I had this big coat, very thick coat. You could probably not even see I was a woman under this huge coat, but that I was taking a walk. And I see these hundred pandits coming, walking towards me. And I thought, okay, what's gonna happen? Because they're not allowed to see a woman in their life. They're literally closed up normally. They're just gonna walk from one building to another, quite a long walk. And I, I thought this will be interesting because I didn't really have that belief myself. You know, I thought it's just a ridiculous belief. But I came walking and then some guard came and said, Ma'am, could you pl please just stay here for a while while those men pass by? <laughs> so, I, so it was just a few meters between me and them. And they walked by and most of them just looked down. But maybe every 10th or 15th man, he, they actually looked at me. <laughs> they, they, didn't, they broke the rule and they looked me in the eyes, you know. And it, it felt really beautiful. It felt like a, a, a profound experience. But yeah, then I left that place. And, but I had to face a lot of fear. And then uh, David called me and and said, do you want to come to the peace house? I have a peace house, do you want to come? And I said, yes. And I had contacted him earlier and said, I have one day off. The, in this program, you have one day off a year, only one day free from meditating. Um, so I, I wanted to meet David. And David said, well, it's pretty far to go to Cincinnati from Fairfield, Iowa. So. If you have only one day, it's going to be hard. But then he called me, this was later on, and he said, um, do you want to come to the peace house? And I said, yes. And I realized that was the Holy Spirit giving me my next step. And I had actually sent David an email saying, I want to come to the peace house. And then he called me and invited me, and I... I I was very, very scared because remember, I'm a mother. I had a son, a 10 year old son, and I had left him in Sweden. And I felt really out of my, out of my comfort zone, a bit out of my mind. I felt very, very scared. And it was a deeper fear than I ever, <coughs> than I ever had felt. It was a profound fear that, and I sat in the library writing this email to David, not even knowing how I was going to be able to walk home from the library. So much fear. And, and I, I thought, I had a thought, imagine that you hold yourself in the hand and we walk together. <laughs> Something like that came in. And I, I took my own hand, it's like I had an angel or something, I walk home still in fear and then that's when David called and said, you, um, you can come to the peace house. And, and then I come downstairs to the, the woman I stayed with and she said, you have to leave. You have to leave and I need to buy a ticket. She had some stuff come up because she was threatened by me because she had a lover there that I didn't know they were lovers, they were secret their relationship was a secret, so they had not told me. And I thought he was a nice guy, so I had some conversations with him. And and she suddenly said, you have to leave now, or I'm going to book you a ticket to leave on Thursday. And first the ego was like, no, who is she to tell me? And the Holy Spirit said, no, no, it's me. I'm helping you on here. You, you need to go to your next destination. It's me. Trust. So I just said, okay, thank you, I said to, to the Holy Spirit and to her. I said, thank you, I will take that ticket. So I went on a Greyhound bus 
I'm very feel I go to Cincinnati all on my own. I was so scared. It was a night, you know, going on the day and night on this bus, many, many stops. And mostly there was black uh, people, young men, and I felt very scared. <laughs> sat on that bus <laughs> trying to figure out you know the next station and where I was going and yeah so that's that's how I came to David and then a whole other adventure started <laughs> this was this was the little preparation for me and then I was there and first of all, David wasn't even there the first week. I was there on my own with his two cats and an old man who was looking after the house. So that was also very, um, it was a bit strange. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing there. <laughs> I just knew the Holy Spirit had brought me there. And then David came from travels. I was part of picking him up at the airport and we came home. I sat in the sanctuary there in the peace house. David came in and I had this boom, this powerful connection, light experience of connection with him. And that, that started this profound, I felt just brought into the light. I felt like, yeah. It was telepathic with David, we didn't hardly need to talk. And, and in that I felt such deep trust, but first I, I had, I was afraid. Because with perception, you know, Jesus does say in the Course that, that projection makes perception. And if we have unresolved issues and beliefs, we project. We project that onto others. So I saw something from my own past there and I thought I cannot trust him and that just suddenly came and I I thought I need to leave I need to get out of here <laughs> and I sat for a whole night in the kitchen thinking about how can I get out of here and I thought I had no money how do I get back to Sweden I was in the suburbs of Cincinnati. I had no idea. And I thought, okay, there was a little sliver of faith in me. And it said, well, try. Try try him out. This was a thought. Okay, okay. I, need, I need to see if, if, he, if I can trust him, if he's for real, if, or if he's just some bastard that I... Because I, I perceive stuff, I saw stuff. And that morning, I just nailed him with my eyes. I just said to him, you, you play no games with me. And I just looked him in the eyes for a long time, just like eye gazing. And, and after a couple of minutes, there was this this oneness experience, I felt like I was him. I didn't know who was me or him. We were just one. It was profound. And, and I thought, oh, I think I can trust him. <laughs> this is love. And, and, then, and then just a few minutes, or a little bit after this experience, he was, he was checking his emails on his computer. And he said, Jenny, there is an email from you here. And it's saying that you want to be here. Says, Hi, David. Can I come and be with you at the Peace House? I would like to be there. And I said, I didn't send that email. I sent that weeks ago before you called me. I, I thought that's why you called me. He said, no, it came in now, he said. So he, <laughs> that email, he had not seen it or it had not arrived in his inbox until that moment. And that was also, for me, that was like, if I had any doubt left, that showed me that Spirit had me there. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit wanted me to be there. So from then on, I cried. I said, I trust you. I trust you, David. I trust the Holy Spirit through you. Um, 
I don't really trust my own mind. It hasn't really brought me much good. <laughs> um, but I want to heal my mind. And I trust you. And I made a prayer. So whatever is unhealed in me, may it come up for healing. May the ego come up so I can get rid of it once and for all. That was my prayer. And, and so I was aware I made a prayer. But from then on, I was in such connection with David. It was so, so beautiful, so light, so telepathic. Time and space was just literally gone. Mm -hmm. And then after a few weeks like that, then the ego stuff started coming up. And it was like a pride. It was like a triumphant, a bad triumphant feeling. You know, triumph. Like uh, the ego wants to triumph over God. Like the ego wants to be right. And the first thing I saw when that kind of feeling, it was an alien, it felt like an alien inside that I... I couldn't really control. It was like a weird feeling. And I, I saw this table in the sanctuary and I said, David, this table is real because I can touch it. I can see it. Matter is indeed real. And David was calmly just looked at me and said, it is a matter of time, he said. That was all he said. It is a matter of time. And I thought, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, it is, it is a matter. Matter of time, okay. Time makes matter. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, it's a matter of time until you're back with me again. Mm -hmm. But from then on, it was actually downhill for some time. It was like... I couldn't really stop that ego, it was just coming up. And I remembered my prayer and I regretted it. There was a point when I regretted that I made that prayer for the ego to come up because it felt, it felt quite dark. It felt quite, yeah, a lot of fear and disillusionment. And it was so, so much fear that I had to leave. I, I, I fled the peace house. I found a way to get back to Sweden, get back into the role of being a mother. But I was like a shell. I was an empty shell. And I, I tried to do the right things, but I wasn't really there. I didn't know where I was. I was, you know, nobody home. And I was very scared. Um, but I didn't see any other way. I in this world you have to manage and I got a job as a school teacher as a shell <laughs> I was a shell of a person and I said the right things I, I knew what to do but I wasn't I, I was in very much fear and, and I had that job uh, I tried to manage um, and then later on I did connect with David and, and he said, why don't you go to the peace house in Sweden? There is a peace house in southern Sweden with some people who study the course. Why don't you just go there? So I did go there. But I felt still very much like out of my mind and, and, and I tried to connect with them. But I felt as if I had, I had had an experience that I didn't know if anybody in the world had had. I felt alone. I felt like my biggest prayer was I wish, I wish I could meet someone who knows what I'm feeling. I wish I could talk to someone who has gone through a similar experience. But no one. No, and I tried to talk to Course in Miracles people, but it felt as if they, they had not taken those steps that I had taken. They had not had this ego come up in it. The, they were still in their comfort zone. They were still in their familiar lives with their 
husbands and wives and feeling very safe and so I didn't feel like I could connect with anyone so so I just I just prayed it was as if I I thought I, I would die but I felt like I was pulled through like a dark tunnel somehow you know step by step I literally felt like I I had to tell myself to take one step after another I I literally didn't know what I was doing <laughs> during this time it was going on as for maybe seven months and then and then it started to become a little feeling a little better a little less fear and I realized I need to extend something started in me a little seed of this feeling like because the course talks about you need to extend you either extend or project there's nothing else you either extend or project and I thought I need to extend and I went to some spiritual club and I thought, I need to extend, but I have no idea how to extend here. We sat on the floor in a circle and I, I thought, I don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I called David after and I said, David, I need to extend. He said, and I said, I don't know what to do in my life. I think I'm going to go to a yoga course where I can fast and meditate for one month and be in silence because I had found one online. So I'm going to go to a yoga school, fast, meditate, be in silence for one month. I feel like doing that. I said that to David. He said, sure, you can do that. But if you want to, you can come with me to Australia for some traveling and gatherings, he said. And I thought, oh, okay, that, that, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so I said yes to that. So first I flew to America, back to the Peace House. And then we all, four of us, me and David and Jason and Kirsten, flew over to New Zealand. And uh, did gather, we did a retreat in New Zealand. We flew over to Australia. We did the Gold Coast tour. And we were taken care of, we were brought into people's homes and they, they were very generous, they gave us so much food, they were so happy we were there. All my unworthiness was brought up. I felt so unworthy. There I was, I didn't offer anything. I felt like a little mouse, you know, coming along there with David <laughs> <laughs> and receiving everything. And I felt so guilty. I felt so bad. And I, I tried to talk a little bit about it sometimes, and, you know, but I was very shy. And we, it went on for a whole big tour, different homes and different people. I mean, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And a lot came up. And this is where I feel like I really started to do the mind training, started to take my steps to face the ego. The ego was very, very vicious, mm -hmm. very... Um, angry, very, very angry. I have many things, jealous, angry, envious. Yeah, it was a lot of strong feelings uh, for, for uh, quite a while. But I knew what I was doing. I knew I needed to do it because, all, because before this uh, I had I had an experience because I had a lot of doubts of leaving Sweden in the first place when I was called to go to this um, transcendental meditation school. I had a lot of doubt leaving my son, but then the Holy Spirit sent, uh, gave me a very mystical experience of uh, bringing in two light beings, two higher beings, like two angels. They were uh, very, they were just huge. They were really beyond time and space, but they told me to go on this trip, on this journey. And, and uh, I realized that I need to heal my perception because that experience was so real and it was totally beyond form, beyond, beyond the physical realm. And it was more real than anything. It was more real than anything I had experienced. It was communion. It was a, it was a joining in the light 
of oneness. It was just, it was not me and them, it was one. It was in this oneness. And so I realized when I had that, that experience, when I came out of that experience, I realized that my perception is completely distorted. My, I'm projecting a world that is very distorted and I need to heal my mind. I need to give it my all, 100%. Nobody else is wrong, really. It's my mind that is wrong. It's, it's distorted. So, so I knew that. So, so this was before I went to Fairfield, Iowa. So that happened. And then I had that experience with me, even though I could actually not talk about it for a whole year because it was such an extraordinary experience out of this world that I didn't have words for it. But after about a year, I shared it with David, and then, then I, I realized what, what had happened. Mm. But there was such a helpful thing to know that my perception is, is faulty, is wrong, and, and, and I need to heal it. So... So when I was going through all this ego stuff, I knew why. I knew it was just my mind that the only way to do it was to face it. <laughs> it wanted to be projected, of course, the ego does that. It wants to be angry at other people, the situations. They do this, they do that. I'm unfairly treated, I'm a victim, I'm, they should be better to me, or you know, whatever the ego is saying. But I knew, no, no, this is my mind, I have to, I have to face it, I have to forgive, I have to go through this process, I have to sit and burn, it felt like sitting in a burn of, of emotion, often, or laying in my room, hiding with my emotions, just, just going through, let it burn through. Um, so I did that a lot, even during that tour. So yeah, so that was my, uh, my first beginning steps. And then it's been beautiful. It's been a lot, a lot of healing. I've gone through a lot of healing and a lot of traveling, a lot of different people and relationships and groups and communities and many different assignments um, for healing, for healing and further and further and further and further it's gone, you know, and, and now until, until here and now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so I met Barrett in uh, 2020. We, we met online, I think, I was friends with him since 2013 on Facebook, but I had only like seen him there on Facebook, seen his face only, literally the face and his sweet happy face, and <laughs> <laughs> and I had just seen you know I thought seems like a nice person, and, but we had not interact, we had not connected or interacted, and, but then in 2019 I had this prompt to reach out to him. And I wrote a little message and I buried a feel to connect. I don't know what I said. I said something like maybe we could do a gathering. Yeah, teach together or it was something like that. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, Yeah, that would be nice. Let's have a call. <laughs> so we had a call and we we did some online sessions that didn't go so well. I didn't feel I didn't feel they were great because it was more about our connection. We had our own private calls that were very deep and very, very healing. Like it was like we were kind of complimenting each other in some way. Like I felt like I, I was helped by him, he felt helped by me. I got this image pretty early on of like, of like two ladders like next to each other. And like there would be times where Jenny could help me up a couple steps. And then there would be times I could help Jenny up on some steps, and it was just like, we were going to help each other, mm -hmm. like, all the way up the ladder. Yeah. Yeah. 
but we were just friends. It was very deep friendship, <coughs> very supportive. But it wasn't like a, it wasn't a feeling that we would be in a relationship or anything like that. It was just very powerful uh, support, helpful support. We maybe had a call once a week or when he scheduled it in. <laughs> in the beginning, I, I, I did that the first time we were going to connect. You know, it's like, oh, let's have a call. I'm like, how about next Tuesday at 9.30 here, you know? He said, I'm available, like, maybe on Tuesdays, yeah, at that, at that time. I had my calendar, and I was like, oh, there's so a and so slots long. open. I have a slot for you. <laughs> and I thought... Jenny didn't really roll that way. <laughs> 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 it's like, why don't we check in on Monday? Uh, we'll see, we'll see if that is a, a good idea. Yeah. So I got used to that. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he was usually, okay, now it's time for me to wrap it up here. Like, <laughs> he had a deep call or something, and he, he was going by his schedule. I had another, yeah, another <laughs> client to talk to. Anyway. <laughs> I, to do's. <laughs> yeah. So we had it like that for a while, but I think it loosened up a bit around me with, with that. <laughs> but yeah, then it became more. He, yeah, we had some uh, some different things, some different relationships um, that we supported each other with, and, and I supported him out of relationship because he was, I was not say codependent. <laughs> <laughs> he had some kind of a promise to this woman that he was going to be with her and, but I felt like it was so much specialness I couldn't breathe we, we had met for the first time I was visiting him uh, in Milwaukee and mm -hmm. we were driving to Chicago mm -hmm. and he had a call with her and I felt on the car phone so Jenny could hear the, car, the whole call the whole I didn't phone. hear her I heard you but I think you have the phone, but I felt um, like I was um, what do you call it? You can't breathe. Suffocating. Suffocating. I was suffoc I felt like I'm gonna have to stop the call. Can I stop this call that he has with her? It felt so not helpful. So finally, after like 15 minutes, he finally ended the call, <laughs> and I said to her, Barrett, I said to him. You're not, this relationship is not helpful. You need to. <laughs> uh, almost. The words you used were, I think you're, you're in some sort of compromise. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to say it in a gentle way. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, it was like, the energy of the relationship was like an egg. And, and Jenny saying that was like taking a little hammer and tapping the egg. I could just feel the shell starting to like open. And I'd only ever been in that relationship because I, I've clearly felt guided. I was I was guided to be as a long relationship for many years. But I was I was always willing to not be in it. I mean I, I for a long time I had promised to follow the guidance in my life. It actually led me into that relationship. And then when Jenny said that, again it was like this egg shell started to crack and I for the first time since the beginning of the relationship I was in a state of not knowing I was like I said to to you something like okay I'm, I'm very open to whatever you know whatever is led whatever is guided here so we kept driving a little further and and we got to Chicago and we were meeting with uh, a friend of mine who was like a healer and and we, we joined and it basically turned into kind of like a, a three-person three healing session. It was beautiful, yeah. Prayer meeting. And, we all just shared. And we all kind of opened up about stuff we were going through. And, and in the middle of that, as I was kind of sharing about this, I, I had this clear experience in my mind, in my mind's eye. Where I, I saw... My, my partner and I floating down a river hand in hand and and then the river came to a branch and I could feel her going down one branch and me going down another and my, 
my first impulse was to like squeeze tight, hold tight, so we could stay together. And then, just as I started to, I could feel the spirit saying to me, "No, no, let her go." And I could feel my hand open. I could, I could feel her go down the other branch. And I just, I burst into tears. Because, yeah, it was a long, long relationship, very, a lot of healing, a lot of healing in that relationship. And um, and then I was kind of questioning, I was in, inwardly questioning because I was, I, I was grieved, really, you know, the end of the relationship. Um, and so I asked Spirit, because like Jenny said, I, I, had, I had the belief this was one of those life, lifelong things. I mean, it was 10 years we've been together at this point. Including a promise. You had promised her you would be with her until she dies, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was, even though we hadn't gotten married, I sort of had, you know, the, the standard marriage vow was, you know, to death do you part. And I had that feeling in my, in my mind that that's, that's what we were doing. She had not wanted to get married, but, so we didn't do that. Um, but the promise was in me, you know, to be with her. So then when this came, I was, I was uh, uncertain. I was very uncertain. And so I asked, I asked about that inwardly. Like, what, what, is, what is this happening? And I got this, another image, this very clear image of, um, of the life, uh, till death do part kind of life that I had thought we were doing. And it was like, it was like this big stage curtain. And all of a sudden, this is like whatever was holding the curtain at the top just fell. The whole curtain fell. And I realized it wasn't, even though that's what I'd been seeing the whole time, it, it wasn't it. And I got this message, like uh, another analogy kind of came in that, you know, if I, if I thought that we were, I was running a marathon with her, you know, 26.2 miles, I don't know what it is in kilometers, um, that it was actually only 18 kilometers. I didn't know that, you know, while I was running the race with her, so to speak, I thought, okay, this is where, it's, this is where it ends. I thought I knew that, but it was different. And so then all this just sort of came in and I was just like, in this very open space. You thought you were in Stockholm Marathon, but you were actually leading a lot bit, which is 30 kilometers, 32 kilometers, not 40. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's it. And I've done leading a lot bit. It's hard enough. <laughs> but it just really opened things up and, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he called her and broke up that evening. And, yeah. And we were with some other friends and they thought we were in love because the love was palpable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the love was literally palpable. <laughs> it, was, it was so strong, but it wasn't like, for me, I mean, it wasn't a feeling of a romantic love. It was, it was this higher love. It was like, even when we spoke, to each other, we couldn't even call each other by name. Mm -hmm. It was this kind of higher love. That's all I can say. <laughs> it felt very good. It felt good to sit together, to be close, but it, it wasn't like a guided romantic thing. But later on, like cause he was so, you get kind of activated also physically, and you were like looking for another relationship. <laughs> and I kind of, encouraged him and said, well, try to date this woman that you like. And, and she turned him down. But then later, that summer, you, it was like a strong thing coming in for you. A strong feeling for me. Like a yeah, yeah very, very big love for Jenny. Mm -hmm. it just kind of blossomed in my soul and my heart. And, and I being. just wanted to keep this other, you know, we had this nice higher love, you know, I didn't want to, <laughs> like a personal, interpersonal thing, so I said no. Just, yeah. Yeah. And so I just gave it over to spirit, because, you know, even though I was feeling it so strongly, I, I, I don't want my plan, you know, I only want God's plan, I only want Holy Spirit's plan. 
But when I, every time I would give it over in the very beginning, when when Jenny didn't, you know, seem to have that call on herself, it just came back even stronger. I just <laughs> 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 and so then I'd, I'd share it with her again, and eventually, uh, yeah, it started to open up in her too. The cord is here too. <laughs> He's going to you, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. So that led into a whole new, whole new part of the journey. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so many months after that that we were talking. And again, at this point, it really was, uh, you know, the, the connection kind of love that was, was blossoming between us. And Jenny said to me, yeah, I think it'd be really fun if you were over here in Ireland, because she was in Ireland at the time. And that was just like the easy... But I still had this no, like I had like, almost this feeling, uh, like, almost like, oh, he's not ready. Like... Because <laughs> he was quite she involved with his family and some undoing to do. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the easiest yes I've ever said in my life. When she said, "Would you like to come over to Ireland?" I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah. let's do that." I sold my car yeah. at Jenny's suggestion. Yeah, if you have to sell a car, you have to give up your dependence with your family, and and you're not going to like that. I said. <laughs> You're actually going to become very angry at me at some point, but I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> that all that all happened. <laughs> yeah. 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 He went through it pretty quickly, a couple of years of like, you know, releasing this kind of traditional should should call them should acknowledge birthdays. Christmases, you know, all these rules. It's just, it's a bit intense. <laughs> and and it, I could tell there was something going on often, maybe once a month or every other month, just a few days of like, a bird is going through something, you know, for days. And then he would say, oh, it's my brother's birthday on Saturday. Or it's my mom's birthday. Or, you know, or it's Thanksgiving, or it's Christmas, you know, I could tell it was this, yeah, excruciating, you know, because he's very loving with his family, and they are used to, they were used to him being almost like the glue in the family, and so it was, yeah, but it was good, you were, you were ready and willing, even if it was a bit tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Jesus asks us, you know, he said, to do this course requires the willingness to question every value that you hold. You know, he doesn't say a lot of the values, but every value that you hold. Yeah. It's really not, it's not about giving up people, it's about giving up the tradition or the dependency or the past. We're giving up the past, you know. And sure, a lot of people represent the past, maybe, and we... We need to like give them to Holy Spirit and ask, does the Holy Spirit want to use them in our life? You know, is it truly helpful? And yeah, we just need to be willing to, to follow. And it's, it's for real. I remember early on in the Peace House, because I had been on the spiritual path for some years, you know, I had I would say maybe 10 years, more or less. But I always felt spiritual, like, since church I was into the Holy Spirit. And, and then, um, so I had been spiritual like, for 10 years, but then in the Peace House, I was there. And I had been trying many things. I'd gone to courses and retreats and kind of felt like I, like I was... Um, working on myself, like trying to heal and work on myself. And, and then there was this point when I 
when I realized um, that this is for real. This feeling of like, oh, this is not just some work I do with my mind or, or another course. Or, I realized this is for real. This works. Oh, <laughs> like that. It works. <laughs> like it, like what I studied, what I read in the course, you know, it really transformed my mind, you know, and the relationships needed were given, you know, like it was for real and was also the experience with David was like this insight that because there is a, a beautiful line that I always love in the manual for teachers where it says, you know, a teacher of God has realized that his interests are not different from his brothers. Like you have realized that you have the same interest and that I had a deep experience of that with David because I realized he literally sees my interest as his interest. Like he was there for me, really. Like and I had never experienced that. I, of course I had had some loving relationships and friendships and you know but to that extent that he like he my healing, my awakening he knew it benefits the whole. So he was there for it. He showed up for it, you know. That was a gift. And that's a gift that I now I want to pass it on. I want to just give that gift, you know. And this is this is so beautiful. You see in the in our individual world, in the ego's world, we're so alone. We're striving. We're trying to figure it out. We're you know, working hard for the future. And it's it's not much experience of that type of joining, you know. It's it's new. Yeah, it's and and I realized also there was that comes when we are ready. It 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 comes like automatically. It can't but come when we're ready. It's, so I was obviously ready, you know, even though I was very confused in the beginning what I was really doing. I just followed one step after another. Mm. So yeah, I recommend the course because it's <laughs> it's like the fast way. There are many other very beautiful spiritual paths, but I feel like the course is like so clear. Like it answers all the questions, and yeah, for me, it's just very, very helpful. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I think that was uh, that's it for for me for now. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, the Holy Spirit wants to use us and wants to use me, and I have, yeah, I have been leading many retreats, and and they're very helpful. All I think every there is no retreat that has been unhelpful, and there is also no retreat that has been like any other. Like each retreat is really like designed for what the calling is in the mind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so we really want to be open and, and work with what's in the mind during this time together. And I have no doubt it's, it's, it's happening. Yeah.